Thanks, everybody. It's great to be here. I'm going to totally geek out during this talk. I hope that's OK with everybody. I hope this place can handle it. This, I hope I don't go too far geeky, even beyond what this place can, can handle. So anyway, um, so the naturalists. Um, we got a Chuck E. D. here. And um, so uh, <laughs> um, and, uh, these guys were amazing. They were amazing. In the 17th and 19th centuries, particularly the 1800s, the, um, the, we had a group of people who were totally brilliant and totally fascinated by the natural world and what they found there. And they suddenly had leisure time, and they had ships, and they had societies, and they had microscopes, and they had magnifying glasses and telescopes. Um, and they had the time to really explore. And they had a dedication to seeing what was actually out there and an openness to exploring what was out there and just finding it and describing it in meticulous and incredibly clear terms that is unparalleled in anything we see in the modern meditation world uh, today. So um, this is just one beautiful example of the care they took to draw some of the little things they saw under a microscope. Um, and, and you see the precision and the care with which they, they detailed each of these little uh, magnificent uh, structures. Um, and so that's what I hope to bring today, is a spirit of that kind of exploration um, and explain why that is so important uh, for uh, moving uh, contemplative studies and contemplative practice forward. Um, let me see if we can. So when, when um, the naturalists got to the jungle, they encountered a whole lot of amazing creatures and an amazing amount of stuff. And when they looked through their microscopes, they saw zillions of teeming little interesting uh, things in there. And they saw thousands and thousands of plants and tens of thousands of insects and mammals and funguses and all kinds of amazing things that they had simply never seen before um, in their native countries. And rather than say, oh, everything we see in the jungle is a tiger, or everything we see in the jungle is a bug. Instead, they got really, really specific and ultra geeky about what all these little things were. Um, so anyway, uh, so in the modern meditation world, unfortunately, a lot of what happens is that people tend to stay in their tents, uh, their little own camps, with rifles at the ready, and anything strange that comes by, they tend to shoot at. <laughs> um, and they uh, don't even have the courtesy to stuff it and put it on their wall later. They just <laughs> try to pretend it's over there, and we don't like that animal over there because we're the animals over here, and we're just going to stay in a nice little tent and drink tea and pontificate. Um, <laughs> anyway, so, um, but the naturalists, luckily, yes, they did shoot a lot of things, unfortunately. You know, they were the British. Um, sorry. <laughs> but, uh, but, um, but, but they studied these things, and they took them apart, and they really explored, and they took their skeletons, and they mounted them in museums, and they really meticulously described them um, in a way that uh, we have not done anything like uh, with the world of subjective experience. So anyway, here's another uh, one. Um, this is another German. As a German, we were talking about the precision of the Germans earlier, and uh, this is someone who really appreciated the intricacy of this particularly beautiful starfish and really elevated uh, descriptive science to art. Um, and it would have been easy when they saw the teeming mass of life and complexity in the jungle to just say, oh, there's no way we could possibly catalog all that. But they actually did it. They actually did it. I mean, how many new species are discovered every year? A, a trivial amount. Who goes and gets PhDs in taxonomy? Almost nobody, because it's been done. You know, they, all the life on the planet almost has been described. There's the occasional little microbe, occasionally new virus, occasionally a new thing. Some of that microbiology, because microbiology moves a little faster. They evolve a little faster. And, there's a lot of them, but, um, but really they kind of did it. And so, um, and you think, you think maybe it couldn't have been done, but they didn't shirk from the challenge of describing uh, the external world and the natural stuff we see there. So again, just the beautiful um, descriptions of, you know, there's thousands and thousands of mushrooms, and yet they, they described all of them, basically. I don't think anybody finds new mushrooms anymore. You know, um, beautiful uh, jellyfish. They really uh, just uh, totally amazing in that regard. So anyway, so we, here we go, now moving forward a bit. So let's say a naturalist uh, found a meditator in the jungle, okay? <laughs> so here is a meditator in, in the jungle, and how would they describe them? Well, they are interested in a lot of physical characteristics. They would say, well, this is a eukaryotic part of the biosphere. It's a polycellular organism um, with a, a spinal cord. It's bi biradial symmetry. Um, it also happens to give birth to live young, has mammary glands that feeds those. It's also a hominid-like characteristics. It walks upright. Um, 
And it also has advanced linguistic and uh, tool making and learning capabilities. And they would say, well, this is a homo sapiens sapiens. So that's what they care about. And, that's, and they're right. And they described all these things really extraordinarily well and meticulously d detail. Um, but when we try to go to uh, mapping inner experience, which is incredibly rich and incredibly vast and incredibly complicated, yet we totally fall down. You know, so in comparison to the way they were able to describe limited organisms and the massive range of life that's out there and all its complexity, um, we are positively medieval uh, by comparison. Um, so we are totally shackled uh, by ancient uh, systems that are incredibly limited, incredibly naive. Um, and I've spent a lot of time uh, studying the maps and the terms and all these things. Um, and uh, they are uh, woefully inadequate to the task. If I don't mean to needlessly criticize them, the amazing traditions that have helped us get to where we are, but we need to do way better. So anyway, um, I know a tremendous uh, number of meditators uh, now. Um, not nearly as many as I, hopefully I will know after I get to know some of you and even more people. Um, but what I have learned is that the maps, which are very incredibly limited, simply totally fail to describe the richness of the inner life. They totally fail to describe the developmental progressions of uh, what we see in terms of uh, how people go through the path and what their individual experiences are like. They totally buy into certain package models such that if you get this thing, you will naturally get all these other necessarily abilities automatically, no questions asked. Um, and they totally uh, fail to describe the richness that we see. So, um, so what happened, so a little bit now, I, I ran into uh, people such as uh, Willoughby and um, Judd, and so well, part of why I'm giving this talk, and I realized when I started thinking, because I've got this science training, I actually, you know, I've taken basically all the courses a PhD epidemiologist would take in addition to having an MD, and you know, I've got published scientific papers and whatnot anyway, but I realized that the language I myself was using to describe this field I care so passionately about um, was just total crap. I mean, most of it's just terrible. It's <laughs> not truly useless. Like, it's just bullshit. And I was buying into that. And I had never really examined it from my own point of view and gone, wait a second, hold on. So there's this whole segmented part of my brain that had just totally failed to apply the things it had learned, modern, modern scientific method and, you know, and my uh, fascination and love of the naturalist to uh, what I myself was doing in my own life, in my own practice, in my own book, and all these things. So it was, anyway, it's a real, it was a real problem. And so I realized that we need to do um, a whole lot better um, when describing uh, meditators. Given that I have all this scientific background and training, I, of course, turned to Dungeons and Dragons. So <laughs> thank you very much. Anyway, so <laughs> being an ultra geek of the first order, <laughs> thank you very much, um, I, of course, turned to Dungeons and Dragons. Um, and I thought back to the character sheets because I was, these contemplative neuroscientists were starting to come up with these sort of scales and these sheets and trying to figure out what we actually have there because they want to do fMRI studies, which I think is great. The most fun I had last year actually was the three and a half hours I got to play in an fMRI at Yale. I don't know if that's a sad or beautiful commentary on the state of my life, I'm not sure. But anyway, it's a lot of fun. Um, so, uh, and I realized that they were using these trying to develop scales that you could actually say publish in a journal like Science or Nature, or you could put on the news, or you could actually tell people about and have it not be totally burdened with terminology that is basically just going to cause terrible reactions the vast majority of the time. And so I started thinking about my D&D &D days, um, which were, there were a lot of them, and um, I started to think about the character sheet. So the character sheet, so you describe these characters, and everybody would have a different character. How many people here have played Dungeons and Dragons? Has anybody got a hand? Oh yes, thank you very much. Okay, now keep them up, let's, let's add to this. How many people have ever played any kind of fantasy role-playing game, World of Warcraft, or you know, Star Wars, or whatever these things are, get them up, okay, anyway. So a lot of people, so okay, you'll know what, you kind of know, a lot of you will know what I'm talking about, and the rest of you just have to pretend. Okay, <laughs> anyway. So, but we have a character here, and this character is, is the, um, the class of this character is the geek. Um, if you can't read this, I'll read it for you. Some of you in the back who can't see this. So, and a geek, they had various attributes, and then there's the dragon. So they have strength, and intelligence, and wisdom, and dexterity, and constitution, and charisma. And these would be basically on a 3 to 18 scale, those numbers kind of meaning something in terms of what you could do, 18 being better. Um, and it would, you know, say how, how easy it was to hit you and how many hit points you had, how much damage you can take if you were attacked and all these things. And, you know, and then various skill sets of the various classes and each character has their own little, you know, thing they do. But this uh, here, it says, the techie may forgo paper and pencil games entirely, but when he plays, he does as much as he can on his laptop. He plays World of Warcraft, one of, out of every four hours he's awake and makes a living working as a tech support hotline um, and selling characters on eBay. He has four computers, each with a different operating system, 
just so he can say he has them. He likes techno robots and plans to become the next, next Bill Gates. His uh, skills include video games, computer use, hacking porn sites, programming, and the fetal position. Anyway, so, um, so we have here a model for mapping spiritual development. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> so, or the beginnings of one, because I realized that we have to come up with a better way of actually describing all the nuances of the individuals that are out there and drawing from the naturalists, because there's a lot out there. There are a lot of animals out there in the jungle, and they're, they're very, very different. So as I've gotten to, you know, through these online communities and the internet, I've actually got to meet a lot of these obscure, um, really advanced, really skilled, really deep, interesting, you know, practitioners that have done all these various practices and mixes of practices that are totally unique to them, maybe, their particular combination of what they did and for how long, and they each look really different. They each look really different. They have very different vibes and different interesting perspectives and different things they do really well and interesting things they saw that you know, maybe not many other people have ever even seen. And so we don't know that, this, and the neuroscientists don't know that, because no one's ever gone out and really asked, taken a meticulous survey of the inner life, five minutes, thank you, um, and really seen what's out there. So I'm, I'm going on and on, but okay, anyway. So I started uh, thinking about how you would map some of this stuff, and this is, um, a pic picture of Sister Jessie, and I thought, well, let me go back to something kind of traditionally Buddhist, too, and try to come up with a character sheet that kind of fuses traditional Buddhist criteria and, you know, maybe some modern scientific stuff and some sort of, sect you know, non-sectarian language, and I don't know. Anyway, so this is my paltry attempt at that in 20 minutes, um, which is totally ridiculous, but anyway, so... Um, so this is Sister Jessie, and I met her in Bodh Gaya, and she um, went to India, uh, it was in India, and saw the, um, the staggering poverty and the mistreatment of women and the state of the educational system, just got so angry that, of course, she decided to do a very Buddhist thing and sit in silence for a year. And when she came out of her silence, I'm happy to report, she was actually ang angrier than ever. She was even madder and <laughs> more pissed off about the whole thing. And so she went and sat for another six months, and then she came out in truly remarkable individual. And um, so I started to talk about morality. So morality, um, and she uh, goes around helping um, people very selflessly in the villages around Bodh Gaya, um, and just does tremendous work there. So anyway, Sister Jessie. But uh, it, it, you know, leads to, the, you know, we've got all these different animals again in the jungle and different visions of what we might be able to develop and grow. So like, you know, this is, so in terms of talking about um, morality or training in morality or virtue, um, sila or shila or whatever you want to call it. Um, so, uh, you know, and so the question is, we could ask ourselves, like, what's our, ourselves, what's our own character sheet look like? Or how would we study this? Are two interesting questions. You know, are we really kind? Are we actually really kind? And how kind can you be? Do we actually know what a reasonable scale for kindness is? Like, how kind can you get? And what's the real human range of kindness? I don't think we even know that or how to measure it, but we need to be asking those questions. Or generosity, like for ourselves, like how generous are we? And what's the reasonable human scale? Like, how generous could we be? What do the most generous people on the planet look like? What do the least generous people look like? What, where do most people fall? And how do we compare with that so we can reasonably assess our development as we go along and try to become more generous? Or how's our sense of humor? You know, are we, <laughs> or are we, you know, are we um, uh, Robin Williams? Or are we, you know, so where, are we, where do we fall on this reasonable scale? You know, and so, you know, or um, how well do we relate um, to all the standard temptations of power or money or uh, sexual things um, or, you know, drugs or substances? You know, and what is the ordinary human range? You know, and how do these things, how do development on these things correlate with any other kind of development in the spiritual world? I will actually say a lot of them relatively poorly, um, but that's, we'll, we'll get to that. Um, so anyway, this is just talking about, you know, so when we try to figure out, um, you know, uh, how to come up with a scale for morality. Um, you know, how do we actually do that? And what are actually the qualities? And how do we measure them? And these are some of the things I think that the neuroscientists be thinking of. I'm almost out of time, I think, realize. Anyway, so, and then we, uh, Sigmund Freud, obviously, Siggy. Um, you know, so, so Western psychological health has actually added a tremendous amount of innovation to the Buddhist traditions, as much as I'm known for kind of, you know, saying oh, we've got to do more than that. We do. But, um, you know, how well are we, uh, do we uh, stay free from the personality disorders? How well do we avoid cluster B traits? Um, how often do we use um, mature coping mechanisms? Uh, these are all actually relatively well-studied things, and how do these correlate with any other aspect of spiritual practice? Um, I'm not really uh, sure, but I think those are questions we need to be asking and things that need to be on that character sheet of like what ha our character sheet, the character sheet of everybody else and how it would change as we develop. So anyway, this is a Deepama, um, well known for being a total powerhouse of natural concentration ability um, in terms of jhanic ability and also um, of powers. 
Um, anyway, speaking of powers. <laughs> so, anyway, um, so, and then, uh, so the question for ourselves is how, how well do we actually um, uh, do concentration practices or shamatha practices? Are we interested in those at all? Have we developed those? So, you know, can we actually get into jhanas? Can we actually visualize well? How quickly can we get into jhanas? Which jhanas can we get into? Um, how uh, reproducibly can we get into them? Do we need special conditions? Do we need a real warm up to get into them? How deep can we take each jhana? You know, how far down can even the first jhana or the second jhana go? Or, the, you know, not to mention certainly the higher ones. And have we really reasonably aspired to that ourselves? And what's the range look like? So when you look at really good, well-trained meditators, what do they look like? How many actually have these skills? We, we don't even know this. Nobody's even asked the question um, because that naturalist perspective that wants to know what's out in the jungle has totally um, not occurred because we've just kind of thrown our hands up with regard to the subjective. Um, and so, uh, and then we come to other, let's see if I can get this to work. Thank you. Here we go. Energetics, you know, so like, you know, how, can we, you know, can we actually see or feel the nadis or the energy channels? Can we actually play with those? There are people who can and there are people who do. You know, how many people can do that? Uh, what did it take for them to actually get there? You know, and, and can we ourselves, have we ever done it? Do we occasionally go there? Have we momentarily burst channels or had energetic phenomena? You know, or can we, or do we live there? Are we somebody who just, there are the channels and there we can see them and there we can move through? Again, like we don't even know what the realistic human range is. We don't ever know how many of these people out there who can do these things because no one's actually done this, the, the hard survey work of tramping through the jungle and seeing what we find there. And it needs to be done um, so that we can reasonably figure out what's, what the range is and how we can study these people. And then, of course, um, the nearly vampiric um, um, <laughs> appearing Mahasi Saidao, who I'm uh, such a fan of. Um, and so, uh, <laughs> goodness gracious. Anyway, um, so, you know, how, how well have we done in the path of insight, realistically, and what's out there? So, um, how well have we done in terms of actually seeing agencylessness? You know, and what are the terms to describe this? To what degree does reality just seem to be doing itself? What aspects of things just seem to be occurring? How often does it seem that reality is just occurring? Thoughts just occurring? No self in them? Action just occurring? Effort just occurring? Um, you know, do we, have we occasionally glimpsed that? Do we go there sometimes? Do we go there a lot of the time? Or, or do we live there full time? Has that now become truly our living experience as an embodiment of a deep understanding of a no self? And how many of those people are out there? Um, what do they look like? What's the realistic range of human experience? How long does it reasonably take to get to something like that? Um, centerlessness, uh, to what degree does it really seem there is no center, there is no subject, there is no observer, um, and there's just phenomena manifesting luminous or just manifesting, you don't even need to word, use the word luminous, where they are. Um, and uh, to what degree can we see that? How often can people see that? And what, again, what did it take to get there? We simply don't know that. It hasn't been studied. We don't have the data. Um, and then engagement with the world. So obviously we know who this guy is. So um, engagement with the world. Um, to what degree are we actually making a difference on this planet with engage with our government? Um, how do you even measure or scale those things? And how do they correlate with any other aspect of spiritual practice? It's often assumed that if we have one, we'll have the other. If we have the others, we'll have the one. I don't find that to be anything like the case. Um, and wouldn't it be wonderful if scientists had really uh, studied these things? And they are studying these things. It's really exciting. I'm so thrilled that uh, these people are actually doing this and someone's actually paying them to do this. It's totally wonderful. Um, anyway, and so, uh, you know, and so I'm trying to figure out to debunk some of these ancient myths of the package thing where we get all these things simultaneously or um, the sort of, uh, you know, thing of you kind of meditate, meditate, and meditate. Maybe all of a sudden you're enlightened without filling in the range of normalcy between here and there and what that kind of looks like as people go along. And hopefully the scientists will be doing all of these things. Anyway, do I have any more slides? I don't even know. Let me see, I think. Uh, yes. Oh, so one last uh, one. This is, this is too funny. Anyway, so as we try to come up with our own character sheet, like the, uh, the uh, geek leader, the geek leader is an interesting fusion between socially inept and, uh, and having remarkable influence. You, uh, usually several years older than the rest of his party, he talks about opening his own gaming store. And he knows the others look up to him and often uses his influence for personal gain. Um, I hope those of us standing up here remember this. Anyway, um, any skills include the scapegoat, denial, DMing, and the rally. Anyway, so um, uh, anyway, I leave you with these questions. I don't have great answers, but we need to be figuring out more realistic scales and models um, and uh, realistic uh, ranges of understanding what's out there. And I hope to inspire legions of PhDs to get uh, their uh, PhDs in uh, uh, the, the subjective uh, uh, taxonomy of our internal experience um, and figure out how to do it because it desperately needs to be done. Thank you very much. All right.